by Sri Lanka's best internet package for online learning and online working with many amazing offers. Call 1212 for more information. Sri Lanka Telecom. Lenka, tu kuma wedi karaga ne? Lao ju rupyal panata du kala. Mama, en api te ekak bom. Tonight, New Year goodies. We take a look at the government's list of public and private sector offerings to watch out for once budget 2021 is passed. Get with the program. President Gorthabe calls on the private sector to get on board the economic development bandwagon. Changing times. Prime Minister Rajpaksha directs officials to seek out land for possible burials of COVID-19 deceased. Bad timing. Ratings agency Standard & Poor's delivers a downgrade blow to Sri Lanka with a revised triple C plus sovereign rating. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine, this Friday the 11th of December 2020. Nava Sunlight Sakura, then Dikukal Pavatina Sakura Malsuandin. Try out our new product range, celebrate and feel the difference with Bairaha. From Ada Verana, this is Ada Verana First at Nine, live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhammi Kiknaik. Now in your top stories this evening, the government has decided to implement several proposals under Budget 2021 with effect from the day of its passing. This includes proposals made with the view of enhancing the welfare of public servants, small and medium scale entrepreneurs, youth, dairy farmers, as well as students. The government has earmarked a number of proposals made in Budget 2021 to be implemented immediately once the budget is passed. One of the key proposals to be implemented will be concessions granted for housing and property loans for public servants. Once this comes into effect, public servants will be entitled to a new housing loan scheme at a reduced interest rate of 7% through state banks. Under the proposal, state banks will reduce the interest rate on existing and new loans to the 7% limit on loans between 1 and 3 million rupees. Further, only 3% interest will be charged on the first 5,000 rupees. Another set of proposals targeting public servants engaged in COVID-19 related duties will be the coverage of expenses via the Agrahara insurance scheme for those who contract the virus. Accordingly, a public servant admitted for treatment to a COVID-19 treatment centre will be entitled to insurance compensation of 30,000 rupees. In addition, a public servant will also be entitled to receive an insurance cover of 700,000 rupees in the case of death as a result of the virus. These measures will be offered with no extra costs through the Agrahara insurance scheme. Meanwhile, small and medium enterprises will be entitled to access concessionary loans at a low interest rate of 4% to promote the migration of their businesses to solar power. In addition, a capital loan scheme to uplift the COVID-19 affected small and medium enterprise sector is also among the proposals tipped for immediate implementation. The government announced that 18.6 billion rupees has been provided to 10 leading public and private banks to finance this measure. Meanwhile, young entrepreneurs too have something to look forward to. The government announced that a financial assistance scheme targeting young entrepreneurs starting new businesses is also among the budget proposals to be implemented with immediate effect. Accordingly, youth planning to become self-employed after completing vocational training courses can take advantage of a special loan scheme offering a maximum of 500,000 rupees at a low 4% interest rate through the Thurunudiriya loan scheme. The government announced that the loans will not require collateral and will only be approved based on the feasibility of the business proposal. Further proposals included in the budget targeting the promotion of local milk production are to be implemented immediately. Accordingly, dairy farmers can now obtain a maximum loan of 1 million rupees under the Kirishakti loan scheme dispersed through the Regional Development Bank. Meanwhile, in good news for private sector employees, a housing loan facility for both public and private sector will be implemented from the 1st of January next year.
Safeguard hand sanitizer. Navatam nishpadan pella. Neeru ki matti veekata. Lanka fe palam varata handun vaadina. Melly bunthi jikraka. Crunchy veggie. Now, President Gautabi Rajpaksha urges the entrepreneurs of the private sector to come up with measures that will aid all sectors of the economy to experience a balanced growth. During a discussion held at the Presidential Secretariat, the head of state emphasized that the contributions and new approaches of the private sector are vital if the country is to achieve economic growth in a method that secures the well-being of all segments of the society. President Gotabe Rajapaksa met with private sector entrepreneurs at the Presidential Secretariat last evening to discuss measures that can be taken to revive the economy and achieve long-term economic development. President Gotabe stated that his objective is to bring about a balanced growth in all sectors of the economy and suggested the private sector to come up with measures that would help reaching this goal and identify obstacles that stand in the way. During the discussion, the president said that if everything is imported and sold, we will not be able to build a strong economy. As such, he added that the growth of the economy must take place in a manner that secures the well-being of all segments of the society and that in order to do this, the contributions and new approaches of the private sector are pivotal. The private sector entrepreneurs hail the president's consistent and systematic policies to build a strong economy and praise the concessions provided for economic growth via the 2021 budget. The entrepreneurs then told the head of the state of the woes they were faced with, with some of them being the lack of skilled manpower, institutional inefficiency, shortage of building materials, lethargy of some employees and difficulty in finding new markets. The president assured the entrepreneurs that solutions will be provided to the problems faced by them after a careful study. The head of state pointed out that the economic empowerment of all segments of society is a priority. He noted that with agriculture being linked to the livelihood of 70% of the population, the productivity of the sector must be increased while also attracting the youth. Now, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha today instructed the newly appointed election commission to look into the possibilities of holding the provincial council elections expeditiously under either the old or new system. Now, he gave these instructions during an audience with members of the election commission at his official residence in Vijayarama this morning. During the audience, the commission has pointed out that it would be easier to hold the next provincial council election under the old system, adding that future provincial council elections can be conducted under the new system after necessary legislations are enacted. Members of the election commission have also stated the need for amendments to the existing election laws while pointing out the need for a parliamentary select committee. The premier said that a request has been made to the speaker in this regard. Now, the Prime Minister has also decided, or directed, I should say, officials to select a plot of extremely dry land with deep groundwater levels for the burial of COVID-19 deceased. During the special discussion held yesterday, health authorities have informed the Premier that the virus lasts for nearly 36 days in the body of a person who succumbs to the virus. The Premier emphasised that decisions concerning health cannot be made based on persons' religious beliefs or ethnicity and requested the support of all communities in adhering to the health and safety guidelines. The discussion was attended by ministers and members of parliament, including Minister of Justice Ali Sabri and Minister of Health Pavitra Vanyarachi. In the meantime, the government is mulling over the prospect of lifting the quarantine curfew in some areas and as such is urging people to act responsibly during the holiday season. Deputy Director General of Health Services Dr. Hemanta Herath made it clear that the government is not looking to impose mandatory travel restrictions during the festive season. He did, however, say that people instead should impose self-restrictions and travel only if necessary. Sri Lanka's death toll rose by 146 yesterday after two COVID-19 fatalities were reported for the second consecutive day. The victims were aged 66 and 54. The cause of death of the 66-year-old victim was reported as heart failure, while the other victims succumbed to an exacerbation of existing kidney disease. Meanwhile, 536 new infections were confirmed from the island today. 461 of today's new infections were identified as close contacts of COVID-19 patients, while the remaining 75 are from the prison's cluster. Today's figure of fresh cases is almost identical to yesterday's, 
with there being 538 COVID-19 infections. The highest number of cases were once again reported from Colombo with 304 new infections. In addition, 38 infections were reported from Kandy, 28 from Gampaha, 27 from Kaluthara, 23 from Ratnapura, 14 from Gaul, 11 from Ampara, while 10 cases were confirmed from Kurunagala. In addition, 6 cases were reported from Matara, 3 from Matale, 2 from Jaffna and 1 each from Nurelia, Hambantota and Polonnaruwa. The remaining 69 cases were identified as repatriated expatriate workers. Over the past 24 hours, we have carried out over 14,000 PCR tests in addition to the uh, large number of rapid antigen tests that we have carried out. And at present, the Ministry of Health, together with the Colombo Municipal Council, especially has intensified their work to carry out these PCR tests and to clear the areas under lockdown so that within very soon, the next couple of days we are expecting to relax the movement restrictions that has been imposed at least in certain areas and also I would like to request the public to act with responsibility during this season especially during the Christmas time as well as New Year basically because government at present is not contemplating to make any movement restrictions compulsory but we request the public to impose a self restriction so that your movements are restricted to the essential purposes and to avoid gathering in large numbers in uh, small confined areas and also try not to travel to faraway places unless you have a very specific and essential reasons to do so. With 75 new cases of COVID-19 being confirmed today pertaining to prisons, and 89 inmates testing positive for the virus at the Valikada and Mahara prisons yesterday, the prison's cluster increased to 2,901. Commissioner General of Prisons Tushar Puldenia stated that 816 of them have recovered from the virus so far. At present, there are 7,636 active COVID-19 cases in Sri Lanka. With there being 570 recoveries today, the island's overall number of coronavirus recoveries currently stand at 22,831. Now addressing the 13th Bali Democracy Forum in Jakarta, State Minister for Regional Cooperation Talagabar Surya called for efforts to prevent any potential inequalities as nations seek access to vaccines. During the virtual forum, the State Minister urged the nations to ensure that a coordinated approach is adopted so that all countries receive equal access to COVID-19 vaccines, which in doing so would not only protect lives but the true essence of democracy as well. While adopting recommendations of WHO and local health authorities to contain this virus, the primary focus of the government of Sri Lanka has been to ensure the preservation of life and the well-being of its citizens. Democracy remains a tried and tested system that provides the ideal formula for nations to progress. As countries grapple with the health and economic implications of this crisis, the fundamental principles of democracy, including the freedom of movement, association, may be inadvertently compromised for the greater good of the society. It is vital to understand there is no one-size-fits-all system of democracy. This, I believe, like all other differences, is something that needs to be understood and respected by all. All. With new surrounding breakthrough in vaccine development, the world looks on in hope that return to normalcy may be on the horizon. Being nations that value cooperation and partnership, particularly at the regional level, it is vital that we prevent any potential inequalities as nations seek access to vaccines. Therefore, we must ensure that a coordinated approach is adopted so that all countries receive this vital vaccine and that no one is left behind. By doing so, we will be protecting lives and the true essence of democracy, a system that should work for all and not only for some people. We will see you once more on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Salem Bank, the bank with a heart. Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. Now, Sri Lanka can expect a stunning display in the skies over the new uh, next few nights as the Geminids meteor shower will turn the night skies into a colourful display until the 17th of this month. With that, on the 21st of this month, we can look forward to another unique experience in the night skies as a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn will be visible at its closest point since 1623. 
there will be three prominent celestial events in this month in december and one is a meteorite shower known as gemini meteor shower and this meteor shower is already activated from december 4th and will be ended up on 17th of december if you look at the sky even now you can see some meteors are crossing the sky but the best date is 13th of december night and when you look at the, the north eastern skies around 10 o'clock in the night you will be able to see some meteors actually we expect about 120 meteors per hour this is the best meteor shower in this year and this meteor shower can be seen during the whole night and then midnight the sun will come to the nearly overhead and then in the morning you have to look at the northwest direction but of course there is no need of a particular direction the meteors will go all over the sky and they will be in multi colors like white blue red yellow etc the best time to observe this meteor shower is 14th morning from 2 am to 4:30 am in addition to this on 14th night that is from 4 pm onwards a uh, polar eclipse will start but uh, the other side of the world that is visible only to the people in south american countries and the total eclipse is actually visible only for peru and latin american few countries but uh, this uh, eclipse maximum is at 923 pm that is night for us this total solar eclipse is not visible to sri lankans Meanwhile, senior research scientists of the Astrology Unit at the Arthur C. Clarke Institute, Indika Madagangura, explained the significance of the Jupiter and Saturn convergence that is due to take place on the 21st of this month. Saturn and Jupiter, uh, our gas giants in our solar system, are getting closer and closer together and are set to a phenomenon called conjunction on 21st December. Closer, they will be uh, on less than 0.1 degrees apart. It is a one-fifth of moon diameter. This event you can observe in your naked eye. And this conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn occurs one in uh, every 20 years. This conjunction you can ob- observe just after the sunset on the 21st December. and this year's conjunction is the first jupiter conjunction since the year 2000 and also the closest jupiter saturn conjunction since 1623 only 14 years after the galileo made his first telescope this is one of the very significant of this conjunction and uh, next conjunction you can you will be able to observe in, in uh, 2080 2040 and 2060 uh, the conjunction will be happening but you can't observe because it is in the daytime Now, former Kurunagala Range DIG Kitsiri Jalat told the Easter Commission yesterday of significant external pressure on him following his arrest of controversial gynecologist Dr. Shafi Shabdin after Intel units discovered a flow of funds from the National Tauhid Jamaat organization to the suspect. The DIG stated that such pressure led to him being transferred to the Putlam district. Meanwhile, the commission was told by a witness who blew the whistle on the Nuerelia terror training camp of police intimidation to silence any attempts by him to reveal how the police bungled investigations following his complaint of suspicious activity. Former DIG in charge of the Kurunagala range, Kitsiri Jailat, testified before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry investigating the Easter Sunday attacks yesterday. The DIG revealed to the commission that a total of 226 suspects believed to be connected to the bombings were taken into custody in the Kurunagala district after the attacks. The DIG was asked by the commission whether intelligence units under his purview had reported to him that the village of Kakunugolda in Kurunagala was the hometown of Zaran Hashim's wife. In response, the witness told the commission that no such information had been provided to him and that he had only heard of Zaran Hashim after the attacks. Continuing, the DIG stated, the arrest of six suspects who were linked to the attack was heavily publicized in the media. Police officers, including myself, were able to arrest two of the suspects within a short time. By then, I had received about 45 pieces of vital intelligence information with which I was able to arrest a key suspect. However, as soon as the suspect was arrested, I was subjected to intense pressure on social media as well as by other means. Such pressure led to my transfer from Kurunagala to Puttalam. When the commission asked the witness to reveal the identity of the suspect, he stated that it was Dr. Shafi Shihabdin, an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Kurunagala General Hospital. The commission then asked the DIG whether the suspect had any political affiliations. The DIG replied, "Yes, I learned that the suspect had close links to former minister Rishad Batyuddin. Intelligence units had also discovered a flow of funds from the National Tauhid Jamaat organization to the suspect." That was the reason why I ordered an investigation to be carried out and legal action to be taken against him. 
Meanwhile, DT Ilay Singer, a Nurelia resident who provided information regarding the militant training camp set up by Zara and Hashim at the Takshila Holiday Resort in Shantipura before the Easter attacks, testified before the Presidential Commission via video link today. The witness revealed that on two occasions in the month of April and May 2018, he had witnessed groups of suspicious individuals arriving at the Takshila Holiday Resort located near his residence. The witness told the Commission that while he was engaged in monitoring the group, he had overheard the suspects saying, there is no point storing the money and weapons here. We should move it to Katankudi. Following this, the witness stated that he had then informed IGP Pujit Jaisundara over the phone that suspicious activity was taking place at the location. The witness added that the IGP then informed him that he had relayed the information to DIG Mahinda Disa Naika, who was in charge of the Norelia Division at the time, who would call him and carry out an inspection of the location. The witness revealed that despite placing the call to the IGP on the morning of May 8, 2018, a group of police officers only arrived at around 4 p.m. that day and the investigations consisted of one officer entering the location and leaving shortly afterwards. Further, the witness told the commission that after the attacks, he was visited by the same police officer who entered the location, identified as Sub-Inspector Indrajit, who proceeded to force his silence by saying, You were right, we arrived late that day, but don't reveal this to the media. The witness further stated that when he had inspected the house on an early occasion, he had seen 1 million rupees cash and cannabis stored inside the house. The witness also stated that he was once again subjected to police pressure, this time by a Sergeant Sunil of the Nuradia Police Station, who had told him not to reveal this incident to either the media or anyone else. Meanwhile, Namal Kumara, who alleged the existence of a conspiracy to assassinate prominent VIPs, was summoned before the police unit of the Presidential Commission today. The Sri Lanka Air Force has received a special radioactive material detection and radiation measuring equipment kit earlier this week. The new equipment is expected to enhance the capabilities of the chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear and explosive wing of the Air Force stationed at the country's international airports. The Air Force is one of seven main stakeholders who, in cooperation with the Sri Lanka Atomic Energy Regulatory Council, deals with the control of any nuclear or radioactive situation that may occur within the country's borders. The donation took place at the Ministry of Solar Power and Wind and Hydro Power Generation Projects Development in Colombo and was attended by Commander of the Air Force, Air Marshal Sudarshana Patirana. A UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, has slammed high-income countries for ignoring the plight of children and focusing mainly on businesses in the domestic financial recovery packages. The UN agency revealed in a report that out of a massive $14.9 trillion in stimulus and relief packages implemented, only a mere 2% has been earmarked for poverty support for children as opposed to 80% for businesses. The UN Children's Fund UNICEF has slammed the levels of financial support for children allocated by high-income countries during the pandemic as totally inadequate in a child poverty report issued last week. The report shows that of the 14.9 trillion US dollars spent on domestic financial recovery packages put together by wealthier countries between February and August, just 2% was allocated specifically to support children and families raising children. This is despite evidence that child poverty is expected to remain above pre-COVID levels for at least five years in high-income countries. Director of the UNICEF Office of Research in Florence, Italy, Gunilla Olson, stated that the amount of financial relief allocated directly to children and families does not match the severe fallout of the pandemic, nor how long the crisis is expected to impact these countries. The study also found that businesses were by far the largest beneficiary of fiscal stimulus packages, absorbing around 80% of the available funds during this period, and that the most marginalized children will suffer most as a result. Around a third of the large economies surveyed from the European Union and OECD group of high-income nations in the report did not implement any policies specifically aimed at supporting children during the first wave of the pandemic. On the whole, the social protection measures for children and families that were enacted in other countries, such as childcare, school sustenance and family allowances, only lasted for an average of three months, far too short term to adequately address the projected length of the crisis and child poverty risks in the long run, the report noted. As temperatures drop in many parts of the world and cases rise, UNICEF is urging governments to bring in more balanced recovery plans during the second wave, with a greater emphasis on social protection for children and unconditional income support for the poorest families, allowances for food, childcare and utilities, and rent or mortgage waivers. We will see you shortly. Bear with us. Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. 
Now, ratings agency SMP has slashed Sri Lanka's credit rating to triple C plus today, citing concerns that risks to the country's debt servicing capacity have risen as the COVID-19 pandemic squeezes the government's ability to generate earnings. SSP, SNP's downgrade from B- follows similar moves by Fitch and Moody's in recent months. Now, the ratings agency said that Sri Lanka's fiscal deficit is likely to remain elevated in the wake of the government's recent expansionary budget measures and added that the measures will likely worsen the government's heavy indebtedness and add to repayment burden. It also noted that Sri Lanka's external profile remained weak given that the high share of dollar-denominated debt exposed the government to shifts in risk sentiment. SNP expects the fiscal deficit to remain elevated at 10.2 percent of GDP in 2021 and narrow gradually to 8.4% in 2023. It anticipates the net general government debt to ex exceed 100% of GDP in 2021 and remain high over the next five years. Now, the Asian Development Bank says that Sri Lanka's second wave of uh, COVID-19 is expected to worsen its economic contraction this year. However, South Asia's growth forecast for 2020 has been revised up with 6.1% contraction on the back of improved prospects for India's economy. The Asian Development Bank warns in its latest outlook that the second wave of the pandemic in Sri Lanka is expected to worsen the contraction of the economy this year. The ADB says that in Sri Lanka, economic recovery was underway in the third quarter, but a rapidly expanding outbreak from early October brought localized lockdowns and restrictions, and the economic effects compounded by resurgent outbreaks in the country's main export and tourist markets. The ADB said in a supplement to its Asian Development Outlook released yesterday that these factors are expected to worsen contraction in 2020. However, the ADB noted that with improved prospects for India, South Asia's growth forecast for 2020 is revised up from 6.8% contraction to 6.1%. Further, the sub-regional growth projection for 2021 is revised up slightly from 7.1% to 7.2%. The GDP forecast for financial year 2020 has been upgraded from 9% contraction to 8%, with GDP in the second half probably restored to its size a year earlier. The growth projection for financial year 2021 has been kept at 8%. Today the market entered the 14th day in its green run as the index uh, has crossed the 6600 mark and is now at uh, 6614 points. However, with the market having one of its uh, longest runs, what we are seeing is now the upward momentum is starting to slow down. So today the gain in the index was just 5 points, though the index has now entered a 3-year high. And with that, what we are also seeing is turnover levels have also picked up again and continuously during this week, we saw 3 billion plus turnover levels and even today, the turnover levels are closer to 3 billion. In addition, if you take the number of transactions, transactions also have been around uh, 25,000 transactions. So with that, we see a significant amount of retail activity in the market and these retail favorite counters have been gaining a lot of buying interest over the last few days. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.